Buenos dias, Fleetwood Bible. Buenos dias. We are here to worship our Lord, so let's stand and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Guess what? Y'all got me for announcements too. Let's go. Let's go. Welcome, everybody. We praise the Lord because we know that He is worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Amen. 
Welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome home, everybody. If this is your first time here, we do have cards in the pews as well as an online card in our homepage. So make sure you fill that out. If this is your first time here, uh, whether it be uh, here in the building or over in Facebook Live, uh, we want to welcome you properly. So make sure you fill out one of those Connect cards. If this is your first time here, also make sure you stop by our uh, guest services table. We want to welcome you properly. We want to get to know you a little bit better. We also have a gift for you that we just want to uh, give to you as well. Amen. Having said that, I just got to brag for a minute because next Sunday, <clears throat> it's our turn. All right. Take note, people, because it's Father's Day. And I'm just saying, I like gifts. Just throwing that out there. But we are going to be celebrating, and uh, not only are we going to be celebrating Father's Day, we're also going to be celebrating our homecoming Sunday. So uh, people, some people are still, you know, going to service uh, at the comfort of their own home, making sure that they stay safe. But uh, we believe it is time to start really congregating and, and worshiping uh, alongside one another. So we want to welcome everybody back to the building. So make sure that next Sunday you wear the your alma mater's jersey or some kind of uh, uh, sporting gear. Uh, we will allow, by the grace of God, because God is gracious and you know, Cowboys fans and Giants fans are God's people too sometimes. Uh, we will allow that, you know, only only the Holy Spirit. I was told that uh, there was a picture going around of, of uh, two pastors with one a Mets jersey, the other a Phillies jersey with a comment, only the grace of God can bring these two together. And I believe that to be true. So we, we will be gracious, to be honest. You can, and if you're not an Eagles fan, we will forgive you. It's okay. Not, not everybody's perfect. It's fine. I get it. Um, but we are definitely uh, excited to celebrate next week. Also, uh, on July 4th, we will have a combined service. We have Baptism Sunday that day. Uh, we uh, will have a combined service that begins at 9 a.m. There will be no Sunday school that day, so make sure you mark your calendars. And if you're like me and super forgetful about everything, we'll remind you. So we got you, all right? Um, also, nursery. We need baby snugglers and toddler tamers, all right? To be able to be fully staffed for both services, we need about 16 volunteers. So far, we have six. If we want to make sure that we reopen uh, the nursery, I would love for you guys to partner with our nursery director, uh, Mary Crespo. She is currently looking for volunteers. Uh, so to reach out to her. We would love to have our nursery open, but we need the necessary volunteers. If we have 16 people together, that means that you would only have to serve once a month. So make sure you get to talk, to, uh, get, uh, get to reach out to Mary. Uh, we would love to invite you over to, to work with us there. Amen. And also up next, we have a little video. We are going to be celebrating our 150 years of serving this community. That is a huge, huge accomplishment that could not be possible if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we just have a little uh, video for you real quick. So let's check it out. Hey there, FBC family, it's Heidi Foreman, your communication director. I have also been overseeing the event planning for our milestone church anniversary celebration. It's been 150 years since this family started. On September 26th, we will have a special time of worship at 1030, remembering the faithfulness of God during our morning service. We'll have one service in our combined style, and then following the service, we'll be continuing our celebration with a good old fashioned church picnic. We have stood the test of time and we want to celebrate that. It certainly isn't that we are special, but that God has found favor in us and in his goodness, he has honored us with this blessing. Besides, we need some get together time. It's been a while. We're combining our doggy roast or a picnic, our youth soccer game, our bust bank blast, and all in one super fantastic celebration. Our FBC kids are gonna be putting together a time capsule to be opened in 2046, another 25 years. If you have attended FBC for all or most of your life, please reach out to the office with your contact information. We're collecting memories and compiling them in a video. We're also going to be ordering commemorative Bible tote bags and notebooks for purchase by anyone interested. Planning has begun and more details will be coming but for now, we need commitments from you. For the kitchen team, 
decorating and setup team, carnival team. Yes, we wanna get out in the community. And other specialized roles like video creation, carpentry work, clerical and tech support and activity coordination. September 26 feels far away, but it isn't. Please find me, email me, call or text me. My info is on the website staff page. If you have some time or energy to offer to this special event, I need you. We need you. The river has been flowing from FBC for 150 years and we wanna keep moving deeper where God is leading us. As we look back on the faithfulness of God through the last 150 years, we can trust that he has amazing things planned for our next 150 as we touch Berks County and beyond. Thanks. Amen. It's beautiful to be a part of such a great family as FBC because we continue the legacy that was started in the day of Pentecost when the church began to serve its community. And when you read that history, you notice that fellowship and community were built by people serving together. And the reality of being in church and being in this faith family is that we are able to have a strong community and we are able to bond by serving one another and serving our community. So I invite you, let us serve together. Let us build this community for the kingdom and let us see God work in a marvelous way. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you have called us to serve. We thank you because we are not worthy of this, Lord, yet you still have called us. And not only have you called us, you created us for this. All I ask right now, Lord, is as we continue to praise your holy name and give you the glory and honor you deserve, that you would be with us, that your Holy Spirit could move in our lives and in our hearts, that you could become more real each and every day to us so that we would be transformed by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and continue worshiping the Lord. Amen. I
sing this together. And I see joy rising. I hear hope calling. I see fear hiding. I hear chains falling. I see walls shaking. And I hear doubt running. My God's on his way. Yes, he is coming. And I see joy rising.
seated. It is good to be together this morning here in the house of the Lord. Good things happening all around us. What a, what a worship set that we had. I mean, can we, I know we don't do it like for the cheers, you guys, but can we give it up for our worship team? Awesome. Well, you know, we all, we all have hopes and dreams in this life, don't we? Things that, you know, we, we, dream of that we wish we could do. Uh, it's part of the very nature of being human. I can prove this because if you ask any child what they want to be when they grow up, they usually have an answer for you, don't they? I mean, most of them can tell you, this is the dream. This is what I want to be someday. I want to be a singing princess astronaut, right? I mean, I'm not sure what college you'd go to for that or what your degree should be, but we have the dream, don't we? And when I was a young boy uh, growing up on the mean streets of New Jersey, no, I'm just kidding, it was pretty suburban, um, I had a dream, and I thought one day I might really like to be the pastor of a church in Fleetwood, Pennsylvania. Amen. Amen. You guys don't believe me, do you? Well, well, that may have been God's dream for my life, but let me tell you what I was thinking about all of those years running around the streets of New Jersey. I was thinking about baseball. That's what I was dreaming about most of my life growing up. See, my dream was to be a professional baseball player. Just like millions of other kids, I understood, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind that the odds were against me. Um, but I was, I was decent, right? I was a pretty good little ball player. I was picked for all the summer tournament teams. I made all the all-star teams, you know. My junior year of high school, my batting average was 529, which, if you know anything about baseball, that's okay, right? I mean, it was, it was a decent year. And so, um, Suffice to say, the opportunity was there for me to continue playing after high school. But here's the problem. One little problem. I had also given my heart to Christ by this point. And so um, while everything inside of me wanted to pursue this dream and wanted to find out how far I could take this, there was something else that was living inside of me at this point. It was this frustrating little thing called the Holy Spirit, right? 
And, and the Holy Spirit made me aware of something else that was living inside of me that I wasn't aware of up until this point. But it had to do with baseball and all the success that I was having and just my, my own attitudes. You know what it was? Pride. The Holy Spirit made me aware of this pride that was in my heart. And as my high school career went along, I became more and more aware of this pride and, and the ugliness of it. And I began to realize that this is not a good thing. There was one moment that kind of brought it all into clarity for me. I was on third base in this game, and I was taking my lead, right? Getting off the base a little bit. I was pretty aggressive, base runner. I was pretty quick. I thought I I had the edge on the pitcher. If he's coming over, I, I would have seen it, right? And so I snuck a little too far off the base. The pitcher threw behind me and picked me off. That means the guy tagged me out, and I had to go sit back in the dugout, right? And I was so upset by this that I, in my anger, I punched the ground and I actually broke my knuckle on, on my hand here on the, on the little one. It's still kind of rounded. It looks weird compared to the other one. And, you know, as I went back to the dugout, I was, I was hurting, first of all. Um, I didn't tell my coach that I did it because I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to be in trouble. So I just played with the broken knuckle. Um, but I was embarrassed, right? I was embarrassed that I hurt my team by getting picked off. But more than that, I was embarrassed by my response. I was embarrassed by my reaction to all of this. I realized this is not how I'm made to be. God has a better plan for me than this. And so what should I do? I was coming up to a critical point uh, in my life at this point. My college years were just ahead of me, and I had to make a decision. Am I going to pursue my dream for this life and play baseball in college and see how far I can take this thing? Or am I going to pursue God's dream for my life, which I'm not sure what it is, but I was starting to get an inkling that it might not be this. Well, we're going to come back to my story at the end. Just hold on to that for now. But for the moment, would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 11? Uh, We're going to be looking at a story today that I think is familiar to many of you. If you've grown up in the church, if you've read the book of Genesis, this is kind of like one of the highlights, right? The Tower of Babel. It's a story that maybe we've been waiting for. It's a pretty cool story, right? But what we're going to encounter here are a bunch of people whose attitude is much like mine was in high school. Uh, There's a lot of pride that is filling their lives. They have their own plans and dreams for life. And the question is, what are they going to do? Are they going to pursue their plans and their dreams and their goals for their own glory, or are they going to put that aside to pursue God's dream for his glory? So let's get into the story. Let's look first of all at the plan, the dream that these people have in verses 1 through 4. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So the author begins by kind of laying out the scene for us. He starts by saying that the whole earth had one language. Literally in the Hebrew, it says the whole earth had one lip. Now tell me that's not a weird visual. But the idea that he's trying to get across here is that we are jumping backwards in the timeline, right? We just studied Genesis chapter 10. We looked at this genealogy. And by the end of it, the people had spread over the, the whole earth. There were many uh, people groups that had their own, uh, their own culture, their own customs, and their own languages. And now the author jumps back and he says, in that time before all of this, right, when there was one people with one lip, with one language, this is when this story happened. So he's setting the scene. He's telling us the time period of when this is. In fact, this story that he's about to tell us is going to explain how all of this came to be in chapter 10, that people were everywhere with all these different languages. So, having clarified the time period, the author now points to the setting. He says there was a plain in Shinar where they settled, where they built this city, right? This is where they built their their city, their tower, on the plain of Shinar. Now, I have a map here for you just to kind of explain this. Shinar later became known as Babylonia, right? Babylonia is, is not the city of Babylon, it's the greater region. It's like the whole area. Make sense? So like we're from Fleetwood, which is part of Berks County. So it's, Babylonia is the larger area. That's Shinar, okay? And within Shinar, they built this city named Babylon, for which the entire area came to be known. It was kind of like, you know, the, the biggest city in the area. Does that make sense? 
And then within this city is a tower. So this is what they are doing here. Now, there, there was a piece of information given to us last week that I didn't really pause or dwell on at that time because it was going to play a bigger role this week. So we're kind of going to deal with it now. Uh, but this was found in Genesis 10, 8 through 12. And uh, the author tells us there that there was a mighty warrior from the line of Ham who went by the name of Nimrod. That's a pretty funny name, right? I don't know, when I was a kid, we used to call people a Nimrod if they did something kind of dumb. But um, Nimrod was this mighty warrior, and it tells us in Genesis 10 that he was the one who oversaw the, the building of many cities, including Babylon, right? He established them. And so as we read chapter 11, we tend to think of the Tower of Babel, right? But there's actually a city that goes along with it. Look at verse 4. The people say, let us build ourselves a city with a tower, right? So actually what they're building is the whole city, and it happens to have a tower that reaches to the heavens. So that's the idea here, is that this city of Babylon is being built here in Genesis chapter 11. This is huge. Now, we're given a a clue here about the timing of these events once again. We saw already last week in the line of Shem uh, that it was about midway through that genealogy that his son Peleg was born, and he was named that because that was the days when the earth was divided, Uh, But also now in the line of Ham, we see Babylon being built in the days of Nimrod, right? And chapter 11 says that not only is the city being built, but the tower at the same time. Perhaps all of this even at Nimrod's direction. Perhaps he's the one overseeing all of this. In fact, the historian Flavius Josephus claims this to be true in his text. And so the idea is that this was the understanding of the, uh, the, the early Christians was that, uh, was that Babylon was built by Nimrod. So back to the story. We see the people making their plans here, right? This is what we want to do. Here's the dream. Let's just, let's just put it out there, right? Let's give words to it. The dream is this. Let's make a bunch of bricks, and let's build a city, and while we're at it, let's build a tower that reaches all the way to heaven. Just a little ambitious, right? I think they might be taking a little too big of a lead, just to be honest, but this is the plan. This is the dream. This is what they are going for. And just like my dream to play professional baseball, I think what we're seeing here is that the dreams of these people are being motivated by their own pride, their own sense of accomplishment, their own sense of purpose, right? Verse 4 gives the reason that they want to build this tower all the way to the heavens. What is it? So that we can make a name for who? Ourselves. They're not trying to make a name for God. They're not trying to say, let's build this wonderful cathedral that will point people to God. No, let's make a name for ourselves. We're going to build a tower all the way to heaven. So what we see is that they are invading the domain of God, right? Not only by trying to build a tower that reaches heaven, which is God's domain. By the way, uh, did they get anywhere close? No, <laughs> they, they really didn't. I mean, God's, God's domain was under no threat of invasion from these people, but that doesn't stop them from trying, does it? Not only do they try to build this impressive thing that makes it all the way to heaven, but they're also doing it for the purpose of receiving glory themselves. Do you see this? They're trying to snatch at something that belongs to God alone, which is the glory. All the glory is his. And here they are trying to heap glory on themselves. Let's make a name for us. And so clearly we see that their pride has caused them to grasp at what belongs to God alone. Now, the Bible demonstrates our purpose as humans. First of all, the reason that we are here is to know God and to love Him. And the second reason that we are here is to love our neighbors as ourselves, right? And part of that, if we truly love our neighbors as ourselves, we will want them to know the God who is the primary reason that we are here. We want them also to know Him and love Him and serve Him. And so if that is true, then it is a a, a primary purpose for us as as a human race to make God's name great, to make his name known. And I want to suggest to you this morning that we cannot do that in any way, shape, or fashion when we're spending our time trying to make a name for ourselves, right? We can point people to ourselves, or we can point people to God, but we can't do both. And so we have to choose. Am I going to be the star of the show, or is God going to be the star of the show? Who is my life going to bring glory to? Do you see the irony at the end of verse 4? Their reason for doing all of this we have, we have to. We've got to do all this stuff. We've got to make a name for ourselves. Why? Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Isn't that funny? 
Isn't that exactly what God does? He scatters them over the face of the whole earth. So they put all of this effort into staying here and holding up and, you know, creating a bunker kind of a situation where God can't displace us. And God says, you know what? You're not going to thwart my plans. Do, do you see here that, that, that this, is, this is exactly what God does, the outcome that they try so hard to prevent? Now, we're going to see why God does this shortly, but what I want you to notice right now is the futility of pride, the, the folly of pride. You know, there, there's no point in contending with God and saying, God, I know your word says this, but, right? Or, or God, I know that these are your ways, but I think I know better. It's, it's futile, right? We're, we're not going to get anywhere. There's no point. God's plans cannot be thwarted by us. So let's look now at verse 5. I want you to see what God sees as he looks at this impressive tower. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. I know it feels like I should read more than that. What I want you to see in that verse is the turning point in the story. This is where the whole thing shifts. Up until now, it looks like maybe the plans of these people will succeed. Maybe they're going to get away with it. Maybe God's not going to notice, right? Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he doesn't realize that they're grasping at his glory, that they're building this thing, right? Maybe God won't notice. But then we read these words. But the Lord came down to see. <laughs> God sees it. Of course he does. He sees everything, right? That's, that's the one thing that we know about God is that he never sleeps. He never slumbers. He sees it all. And so what we discover here is that there's something going on, and there's an intentional irony that is being used by the author here, right? This tower, which the people thought was so impressive, they thought, like, this is really putting our best foot forward. This is the coolest thing that we can come up with. This is going to shine all kinds of glory on us, right? We're going to build this thing all the way to the heavens. What does God see? Oh, that's a cute little tower you guys got down there. Let me come down from heaven so I can see it better, <laughs> right? Do, do you see the idea here? Now, can I ask you something? Can God see the tower from his throne in heaven? He sees every detail of this thing. He knows every detail of their hearts as they build it. So why does the author put it in these terms? I think what he's trying to show us is the insignificance of the plans and dreams of humans as compared to the surpassing glory and majesty of God, right? Whatever we put our minds to, whatever our dreams are, it's insignificant compared to what God is doing. And so God looks at it and he says, all right, that's nice, but I got something better for you than just to build a tower, right? Now, do you remember all the way back, um, Genesis chapter 8, it was a little while ago, we were talking about the flood, and I said that Genesis 8-1 was the turning point of the whole flood narrative. Do you remember what happened there? It says, then God remembered Noah, and everything starts to change. When God sees, when God remembers what did we say that that means? God acts on behalf of the one that he sees. And so when God sees Noah and he remembers him in the ark, all of a sudden the water starts to recede. The ark comes to rest on the mountains of Ararat, and this new creation begins to emerge. It's a fresh start for Noah and for his children, right? Now, we see here in the same way that God sees this tower. What does that mean? That means he's getting ready to act. God is resolving himself. He doesn't come down from heaven just to take a look and go back, right? If he's coming down, he's going to act. That's kind of the idea here. And so we see that, that God resolves to take action, but let me suggest that he is taking action on behalf of those that he sees, just like we saw in the flood narrative. Now that may sound a little strange, because if you read on just a little bit, some of you are thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute. How, how is God taking action on behalf of these people? He's about to dash their dreams, right? He's about to completely ruin their plans. How is that being helpful? How is this acting on their behalf? Well, I hope this morning that you can see that the worst thing that God could actually do to these people would be nothing. That would be by far the worst thing that he could do. He could let them continue in their pride. He could let them be their own God. And that would be much worse because these people are on a path that leads to destruction, everlasting destruction. And if God really loves them, then I want to suggest that he has to act on their behalf. He has to do something here to change this story. 
So look at verse 5 one more time before we move on. Who is it that comes down? I've been saying all along that the pronouns are important. Who, who comes down and shows up? The Lord, right? And in the Hebrew, that is Yahweh. Not the distant creator God who made it all and then steps back and says, I, you know, forget about it, do whatever you want down there, right? This is the loving Father, the God who wants to be known and who knows us in every detail. This is who shows up. This is who comes down. And it's precisely because God loves humanity that he cannot allow them to just continue down this road, right? If he loves them, then he must thwart their plan. If he loves them, then he must crush their dream. Why? Because it's for their own good. And so I hope that you're able to see that this morning. This is a wake-up call from God. And it follows suit with what we've seen already in the book of Genesis, Right? Adam and Eve sin against God and they hide from him. And what does God do? Where are you? Come out of hiding. Let's make this right between us once again. He pursues Cain and he says, where is your brother Abel? What have you done? Confess. Confess. We can still make this right. And so what we see here is a chance for these people to repent, to return to God. I want to suggest to you this morning that whenever God allows our plans to crumble, it's because he has a better plan. And whenever our dreams die, it's because God has a better dream. Do you see this? Hold on to that thought as we look at these last verses that display the plans of God. Verses six through nine. Here's God's plan. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So there's a lot to look at here, but we see that as one people with one language, God realizes that they are on a path to destruction, right? They have collectively set their hearts and their minds on evil and selfish and, and prideful purposes, and this doesn't lead anywhere good. God's aware of this, right? And so he says, what are they going to think of next? If they've done all of this, then what's to stop them from, from doing other things? Like, nothing is going to stop these people. And so God sees this. He sees that they're on a path to destruction, but he is still a good father. He is still the Lord God. He is still Yahweh who wants to know them and be known by them. So let me ask you something. What is a good father supposed to do when his children are in rebellion and are on a path to destruction? What would you have him do? What would we do if it was our kids, right? I mean, a lot of times our kids make choices in life and to them it doesn't seem like a big deal, but we freak out as parents, right? Why? Because we're looking at where this is all heading, Right? We look down the path a little further, and they may see that it's just one thing, but we look at it and say, well, that leads to this, and that leads to this, and like, we start freaking out about where they're not even there yet, right? We want them to take a better path. Here's the thing. As adults, we have this thing called perspective. Right? We've just been around longer. We've been down some of these roads ourselves. We've seen where this leads. We've seen other people walk this path, and we know what happens. And so we want to spare our children the consequences of walking this road all the way to the end. We want them on a better path now. Do you see this? A lot of times, children are living in the moment. They're thinking about just this one thing. Come on, mom and dad, it's just one party, right? It's just one date. It's not like I'm going to marry this person. Why do they have to be a Christian? Do you see this? And, and we, as parents, are freaking out because we see where this is all headed. This is where it starts, right? It starts with just, just one thing, and then it's just one more thing, and then, you know, before you know it, we got a problem. And so we respond because we have a better plan for our kids than our kids do sometimes, right? Why should it be any different with God, the one who is perfect, the one who created us, who knows our innermost being? Why would he not have a better plan for us than we do? He is a good father, and he loves us too much to let us just keep going in our own pride. So what's God going to do here in Genesis 11? Well, he goes down there. That's never a good thing, right? You ever hang out on the upstairs floor of your house, and you hear the kids acting up downstairs, and what do you say? Don't make me come down there! <laughs> Nothing good's going to happen if I come down there, I promise you. Right? Right? That's what's going on here. God looks at all this going on down there. He's like, 
guess I gotta go down there. And if he goes down there, trust me, he's coming down to shake some things up, right? He's gonna take action. He's not just coming down to look at the tower, like, oh, it's nice, and go back to heaven, right? He's coming down there because he's about to do something. Verse seven shows us what it is. God confused their language. And verse nine tells us that this is why the city and the tower became known as Babel. Do you see that it's a play on words? They named their city Babylon, which in their language meant gate of the gods. They thought they were really something. We have built this incredible city. Like this is gonna be just, this is where there's gonna be communion between us and the gods because we have built this and made a name for ourselves. God looks at the same city and the same tower and he says, they're just confused. We're just gonna call it Babel. They don't even know what they're doing down there. Let me straighten them out. And so God confuses their language in this act of poetic justice. And so how, the question is, how is this God being loving towards them? He just demolished their dreams, erased their plans, you know, and scattered them over the face of the earth with different languages. How do we see the goodness of God in this? Well, first of all, we see in verse 8 that they stopped building the city, and by extension, the tower that reaches to heaven. And so, in short, what, what God has done is he has stopped them from walking down this path any further, right? The, the very thing that they were doing that was so offensive to God has now ceased. It's not happening anymore. And so they have a clean start. Do you see this? There's a new opportunity to build something else with their lives, something maybe that would bring honor and glory to God and not just to them. And so God gives them a new opportunity here. But secondly, we see that they were scattered over the face of the whole earth. How's that good? I mean, where's the love of God in this that he has just scattered them over the face of the whole earth? Maybe it's hard to see at first glance, but I want to suggest that this is good and that this is loving, and how we can see that is if we go back to the original blessing. What do we see in Genesis? God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, and what was it? Fill the earth and subdue it. And so the people were never intended by God just to congregate in one place and stay there. God intended them to fill the earth, right? That was the plan of God. And so what we see here is that God has actually put them back into his plan by stopping them from doing this thing that they were doing and by scattering them, he's actually put them back into the realm of his dream for their life. They're no longer pursuing their dreams, whether they intended to or not. Now all of a sudden they're, they're back on the plan of God's dream for their life, and this is inherently better. Do you see this? And so, God puts them back on track, and we can see the kindness of a loving father in this, right? Sometimes we do that for our own kids. We put them back on the right path, even if they don't want to be there, because we know what's best, and we love them. But God's love really blazes in the brightest sense when we understand the greater story here. I want you to see this, because it's, it's so beautiful when you start to see this. See, we said last week that multiplication is more than just a physical thing, right? God did want to fill the earth with people, but what did he want even more than that? He wanted to fill heaven with people, right? He wants eternal life, not just life here on this earth. And so the idea behind physical multiplication is really spiritual multiplication. How can we spread out? How can we fill the earth with people that know Christ and will spend eternity with him in heaven? That's really the purpose of God in all of this. Now, what is God's plan to accomplish that? Well, he explains it in this thing we call the New Testament, right? All, of those, all those of us who know Christ are called to be fruitful and multiply and spread out and fill the earth so that every nation, tribe, and tongue knows the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. This is our purpose as a church. Yet what happens too often in the church? And I'm not talking about Fleetwood. I'm talking about the capital C universal church, right? The church around the globe. What do we see too much of? Too often we see Christians that want to come and gather and hide inside of the church building and never have any kind of a witness out in the world around them. It's all about us, right? And we can get so proud of what we're building here. We've got such great teaching in this church, right? Our, our music is amazing. You should come hear it. It's fantastic. Look at the building that we have and what happens when we focus on our things and we forget about the mission that God has for us in the world is we end up building a monument to ourselves. We miss the whole story of what God is doing. Now, I don't 
think that this characterizes who we are at Fleetwood Bible Church, and I'm glad to be able to say that, but I want to suggest that we have to always be on our guard. It is a small step, and it is a slippery step towards pride and complacency. We've seen many churches fall into this. It's all around us, and, and, and the church starts to think that it's all about us, right? And so we forget about the world that's all around us. But God reminds us through his word that the mission is out there. It's not that what happens here doesn't matter. It's just that the mission continues to be out there. And so it, it's so important for us to, to realize this. God says, gather, yes, by all means, but don't just build a Christian city around yourself and stay there. We have to remember that our calling is still to spread out and to fill the earth with his glory. Teaching, yes, absolutely. This is how we grow. Music, yes and amen. We are to worship God, but don't just keep it to yourselves, right? It's like God saying to us, don't make me come down there. Don't make me, because if I do, I'm gonna have to change some things, right? Remember my plan for you, God says. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Spread out. Go everywhere that people are because my kingdom needs to reach every tribe and tongue. That's the purpose. It's so that, so that we will do all of these things that we are called to do. Wherever people exist, that's where we need to be. And so I'm grateful to be pastoring a church like Fleetwood Bible Church where I do think that a lot of our people really get this. I see so many of you intentionally living your lives in community with people who need Jesus. I think you guys spread out. I think you spend time with people who need Christ, not only with one another, but you know, both of those things are important. God calls us to gather, and he calls us to scatter. He calls us to grow in discipleship and to know him better, and that is what we do here in the church, but he also calls us to share the hope that we have with the people around us who so desperately need it. See, the purpose is that Jesus Christ might not only reach the church, but that it also might reach our neighborhoods and our communities and ultimately our world. So I began uh, this morning telling you about a dream that I had for my life. And that dream was baseball. And it was awesome. I loved baseball. But I told you how God made me aware of this unhealthy pride uh, that was in my heart, really deep-seated. Now, I want to say, just for the record, I don't think that baseball is a bad thing. I don't think that any, any sport is a bad thing. I actually love sports. I think they teach you so many important lessons in life. But for me, at that time, it was an unhealthy thing, just because of where I let it get, just because I let it occupy the, the primary place in my heart. And this is how it became a problem for me. But you know, God was making me aware of some inconsistencies in my life, and so I had a decision to make college is coming, what am I going to do? Am I going to pursue my dream, or am I going to pursue God's dream? Well, I made one of the hardest decisions that I've ever made in my life. And I decided to put baseball down and walk away. It wasn't that baseball was taken away from me. I didn't have some horrifying career-ending injury where I couldn't play anymore. I just decided that I'm going to pursue God's dream instead of mine, and so I put it down. I decided not to play in college, and I didn't even know what God had for me next. It wasn't like God said, here's the better dream. Uh, you can choose this over your dream. Like, I didn't even know what it was. I just had a sense that God had something better, that there was another plan. And so I allowed God to ruin my plan because I trusted that his plan was better. And so two years later, God showed me the plans that he had for my life. It was on the last day of a conference in Illinois. It was December 31st, 1996. And there, God called me to the ministry. He called me to raise up a generation of radical God followers that will make a big, fat dent on this earth for his kingdom. And that is what I've been spending my life doing ever since. And I want to tell you something. There's not been a day that I have regretted my decision to walk away from baseball. There's never been a day that I said, you know what, I wish I would have pursued my dream because it was probably better than what God's dream was. It hasn't happened. There's so much joy and so much meaning and purpose in my life every day when I wake up. And it's not because I'm so good at my job, trust me. I'm not. There's a lot of stuff that I have no idea what I'm doing. I probably shouldn't tell you that. I'm figuring it out as I go. But listen, the reason that I wake up with meaning and purpose is because I abandoned my dream to pursue God's dream. And his dream is always going to be the best. See, it, it all started with a simple prayer of surrender. When the Holy Spirit started to 
point out these inconsistencies in my life, and I began to realize that this is not who God's calling me to be. Uh, I, I just, I kind of came before God, and I prayed a prayer that went something like this. God, I, I see what's going on here, and I know that it's not good. All I really want is I just want to be completely yours. I just want to know what you want to do with my life, and I want to do that. And so, Lord, not my plans, but yours. Not my dreams, but yours. Show me what you want me to do, Lord. Anything that you want me to do and anywhere that you want me to go, I am with you, heart and soul. That was my prayer. And maybe you're here today, and your desire is that you want God's name to be made great in this world. You want to see him spread around the world. You want to see this spiritual multiplication happening all around you. You want to be a part of this. But I want to ask you to take an honest look at your heart this morning because this is where it begins for you. This is the beginning of your story. What do you see when you look into your own heart? Do you see pride? Do you see a desire to make a name for yourself? Because here's the thing, we can never make a name for God if we're really trying to make a name for ourselves. And so I would invite you today, if you're here and if you are so moved, to come down to these altars as we sing these closing songs, to bow before God, to pray a prayer of surrender. Don't do this lightly because it will change your life. God will take you up on this if you surrender your life to him and say, Lord, whatever you want. I promise you, he's got a plan for you. He's got a dream for you. But you got to be ready for this. And so, if you're daring, if you're willing, I would invite you just to pray. Lord, would you ruin my plan so that I can experience your plan for my life? God, would, would you take away my dream so that I can see your better dream for my life? Show me your will, God, and I am yours, heart and soul. I will go anywhere and do anything that you ever want me to do. It's a daring prayer, but it is a prayer that he will answer. And it is a prayer that will result in your life being filled with meaning and purpose every single day. Listen, I'm not saying that, that you need to throw away all your plans and dreams. I'm just asking you this morning, what if God has a better dream? Would you be open to that? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are a mighty God. And more than that, that you are a good and loving Father. Lord, your desire is, is for us. God, when you see us and you remember us, you act on our behalf. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins so that we might be set free from our sinful, prideful lives. Lord, that we might be redeemed for a greater purpose. God, it's bigger than our plans and our dreams. Lord, your dream for us is so much greater. So I pray, Lord, right now that all across this place, in every heart that is watching online, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would show us what it is that you would have us do, and that we would respond accordingly. God, we love you. We thank you for all that you have done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and respond. So I can be here Cause I was calloused And now I can't feel I wanna run to you With a heart wide open Make me broken Make me empty So I can be filled Cause I'm still holding on to my will And I'm completing when you are with me Make me empty
sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. And that's really what we saw here today. Verse 5, God goes down there. I think that is proof that though the sins of the people are many, God does not give up. He goes down, he ruins their plan. He gives them an opportunity to build something the right way. He does the same for us. You know, you hear a message like this today, and it feels like it can blow the doors off of our life. That was how I felt when God showed me kind of the wretchedness of my own heart, and that I needed to walk away from my plans in order to pursue his. But I promise you this, we have a God who loves us, and we can trust him, because his plan is better. And if he's calling you to a different dream, I promise you it's a better dream, because that is who he is. And so we can trust just what we sang here, today that if he makes us broken it is simply so that he can become our one desire our one love and he will not stop working in our lives sometimes he may have to come down here sometimes he may have to show us a thing or two but he will keep making us until he is our one desire so let's trust in that let's rest in that church let's live for his glory and not to make a name for ourselves